getting back to what we're why we're here, and I guess the first question I have is: Does everybody know why we're here? <laughs> why are we here? The Constitution. We're here to study the Constitution, but why are we studying the Constitution? Be more effective. I'm going to add a thwart legislation. What I like. Mean, more effective activists. More effective activists. More effective uh, advocates. And it, this is just brought to my attention because, as uh, political director of the New Hampshire Liberty Alliance, one of the things that we do is we analyze bills. And I don't have time to do it all. I mean, I'll probably have very little time to do any of it, as I will be consumed in providing for my family and legislating and all those terrible things. But we are working on setting up our bill reviewers for this coming session. And we are going, working on setting up a little bit differently. And this is the first step. Because how can you possibly evaluate a bill for its most important qualification, that is, does it conform with the Constitution, which is its authorization for being in the first place? So this is the first step in becoming a bill reviewer or a New Hampshire Liberty Advocate. And that's what these sheets are, is the duties or qualifications incumbent upon a NHL Liberty Advocate. And what we are doing is modeling it in part after the militia which is one of the bills we'll probably be reviewing. And we have divided it into two tiers. We have the hardcore, who are going to be the advocates, and actively involved in reviewing bills. And that would be like the training band. In 1776, our militia was, was divided into two orders. The first order was the training band, and that was everybody who was 65 or younger and uh, was not disqualified uh, for, uh, they had to be, you had to be able-bodied, you had to be within, between 18 and 65, and there were certain professions that were exempt, physicians, members of government, uh, millers, ferrymen, that did not have to be in the militia. Now, some of them were, because John Langdon, whom I introduced you to earlier, and whom I play on occasion, uh, was Speaker of the House, but he was also a colonel in the militia, and went with General Stark on, on his uh, uh, adventure to uh, through Vermont. And um, he also helped personally to raise money, or it's not known whether he actually personally contributed the money, but he certainly made a promise to contribute money. He said, I have $3,000, I have uh, however many hogsheads of Tobago rum, the proceeds of which will go to supply the militia, and I'll sell every plate in my house if I have to. And that was what inspired when, when Vermont said, uh, the British are threatening us, and if Vermont falls, they'll be on your border, and he said, sounds like we'll go help. And that was how he raised raised the militia. Um, but we had the training band, and the training band were all these younger, more able, and not non exempt people who had to go, for instance, in this case, into Vermont, and they could be called upon. The other thing is that we had was what was called the alarm list, and the alarm list was basically anybody who was still breathing. There were still exemptions, physicians, ferrymen, etc., because you had to be able to get across the rivers. You had to be able to have foods. So uh, millers were exempt. Though, of course, they could still participate. But everybody that could stay at, that, that was not in the training band, even if they were over 65, if they could hold a musket, they were part of the alarm list. And if the enemy was at the gate, you had to stand there and hold your musket and defend your town. And even if the, the alarm list was called out of their own town to a neighboring town, they had to march in a separate band from the training band. Training band could march faster. Beautiful. Uh, but the the advocate, the New Hampshire Liberty <coughs> Advocate, is going to be the training band, or in the new militia law, the uh, active reserve. That when we have a bill that has to be fought, <coughs> man, you've got to be there, Johnny, on the spot. You have to be willing to call your legislators. 
you have to, if po at all possible, not if you're out of the state, obviously, but if you're in the state, I mean, you've got to be willing to go up and testify. And then the other people in the Liberty Alliance would be the alarm list. If you can do it, you know, we're going to have a couple, you know, general alarms during this coming session. And you don't want to exercise the alarm list, the people that have to stay home and take care of their kids and all those kinds of ordinary life things too often. But we, we want them to know that they will be called upon. So that's what this is all about. And that's why you're here. And you guys are hopefully going to be the first tier, the training band, the active reserve, so that when we have to analyze bills, when we have to be up there to take action on bills, you'll be there with us. Dan, I have a question. Yes. Um, I'm a teacher, yes. and uh, I want to get more involved in, in the whole political process. Mm -hmm. When there's a bill coming up and you go to testify, um, I can get a certain amount of time off from work, but is there are there a lot of occasions where they change the time or they put it off a few hours where I might not be able to stay and do something? It depends on the chamber. The House, generally, I would say no. Yeah, there will be some delays because things just go longer and it's hard to get people to stop. Although the chairman always has the ability to continue the hearing to another time. You know, if you've just got more people there to testify than the hour allotted can possibly accommodate, then they can continue the hearing to another day. So generally speaking, we adhere pretty well to our schedule, probably within the half hour. The Senate, on the other hand, highly overschedules their time. And you will have something scheduled for, well... 8.05 to 8.15. Right. <laughs> and, and they'll either, either everything will get pushed back immeasurably, or you'll just be cut short and that, hey, that's it, we cut. And if you weren't there, if you didn't get to speak uh, within your allotted time, and I have seen some egregious violations of this. Uh, I mean, one of the, uh, is probably not a judicious practice, it is certainly would be right that a sponsor of a bill get a chance to speak. Uh, but there is a practice that legislators get to speak first. Not because there's anything special about legislators except the fact that we're usually supposed to be in three places at one time. And so if the hearing's at one o'clock and, and you either have your own hearings or you have another bill scheduled for 115 or 130, you need to be able to get in and out and go to the other bill. And that's at least allegedly why it's done. Uh, we had a bill before the Senate on SB 18, that's what it was. And all preference was given not to legislators, not to the general public, but to the bureaucrats. And that was wrong. I mean, I, I was there as a legislator, and I never got to speak before the Senate. They took all these. What was SB 18? Uh, allegedly, allegedly raising the education, the education age. In reality, removing parents from educational supervision. Yeah, right. mm -hmm. Dan, can I make a comment about, or a question really, um, to your question of, if, she, if you have a limited amount of time and it's going to be a big thing, is there value to a mass showing up? And, and if some people have to trickle out because it's taken too darn long, I think you've still sent your message a little bit, haven't you? Well, you've sent your message and there's a, there are other <clears throat> things, in every, whether it's the House or the Senate. You have what's called a sign-up sheet and you have pink cards. Now, in the house we have pink cards and you go up and you hand your little card that says I'm going to speak on behalf of for so many minutes or I'll, and that's if you're going to speak. You also have sign-up sheets and you just say I'm so-and-so, I favor or I oppose. Okay, so if you showed up and put in your name, those generally are counted. Sometimes ignored, but they're generally counted. Um, in the Senate, they do rather the same thing, except there's only just a sign-up sheet, and you check whether or not you're going to speak or not. Yeah. 
Dan, my experience was once when I was there to speak, they shuffled them and then they also stacked them with people pro on whatever it was we were speaking on that one. That particular case was a civil union. That's, be that's because that was wrong. Is a that a well, procedure? Allegedly, what they're in the past, and I will not try to impart motive to the current administration, but in the past, the intent was to the degree possible alternate opposing views. And if you had a, you know, and then the reason they were stacked was so you could get a visual idea of how many pro and how many con. So if you had twice as many pro as con, you'd do two pro, one con, two pro, one con. And that's so that you get an alternating view. It was, but you can use that uh, to exhaust the opposition. If you have all of the people on your side of the bill first, and people get tired and they have to go home, then the people on the opposite, opposing side are probably going to be gone by the time you get there. Alternatively, if you uh, put all of the people opposing you, uh, as your, as your uh, say, chairman of the committee, those who are opposing your view, if you put them up front, then the last word is given to your view. What you can do is you can kind of stack your view in the, at the beginning and at the end, and the people in the middle are somewhat exhausted, you can dispro disproportionately give the impression of participation. I'd like to comment that this may be true on a some high-profile bills, but there are hundreds of bills that go through where the sponsor may show up or may not, and there's one person there, and the committee says, oh, okay. even if you haven't signed up to, she to speak, they say, oh, do you care? Do you want to talk? Do you have anything to tell us about it? And particularly on bills that are not in front of, that are not high-profile, you know, you can go in for a 10 o'clock hearing and, and because I can get time off, but I have to let them know ahead of time, and then I'd have to be back yeah. at the time I said I'm going to be back. The, the ones where you have to wait or whatever is one in <coughs> 10, one in 50? Well, let's see. The, not only a thousand bills per session, I would say, yeah, one in 50 is probably, one, yeah, one in 20, one in 50. One in 50. How many how many bills do we? I mean, you, you can look at them as the bills that occupy double space rooms, the, the separating wall collapse, or over in Reps Hall, and the, and those are few and far between. What are the days the legislature meets? What are the days? The dates. Uh, the, the we uh, <coughs> last two term well last term in this session we have met on Wednesdays. Prior to that, we met on Thursdays unless we have so much business before us to meet on Wednesdays and Thursdays as a session. Generally, in total, except for the Finance Committee, we meet Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So we Year round? No, only through uh, January through June. Unless we dismiss early. As I, earliest I think I've seen us dismiss is about June 17th. So you might be committing for two days a week at most during the period. Right, because you keep, right. And, and, and it's really, the heavy period is in the House is January, well, mid-January, not the first two weeks, mid-January through the end of March. Is that what crossover day usually is? The crossover day is usually in mid-April, and then the Senate's up to here because they get all the bills we approved, and there's only 24 of them. With, with respect to the showing up aspect, I mean, I've, I've only seen this in action now, like, two sessions or three sessions. I haven't been here very long, but... We're talking about this alarm list. I mean, when, when the LA sends out an alarm, it's going to be a high-profile bill. Right. It's going to be something like a constitutional amendment that they tried to pass over on us with education funding, or something like everybody has an opinion. And Take absolutely, and, and that's where we're going to. You're going to see us actually say, "You want to think about putting your kids in someone else's care for the day. You want to think about calling in sick today." Okay. And it doesn't matter that. Three quarters of you, they're going to warn us down, and you bet the tricks will be used. You bet it's going to be another bureaucrat, another bureaucrat, and you get the, the mom there with her kids, just waiting for a chance to speak. Yeah. 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 It doesn't matter. That's what we're basically doing by being there, physically present. We are ammunition for someone like Dan to say there's a reason 
200 people <laughs> put their life on hold today. <laughs> okay. Whether or not you see them in the room right now, now that it's 4.30 p.m. and they've been waiting here since 8 a.m., which has happened. Yeah. Well, yeah, I was on the, 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 the one on the school funding and also uh, the smoking bill, mm -hmm. and the smoking one seemed to go quicker, but I was off that day, yeah. so, so I lucked out. But really, uh, what, what we're doing just by showing yes. up okay. is, is giving ammo to our side to say, these people are not here because they just think this is really entertaining and they have nothing to do with their time. Like They're here. Yeah, <laughs> most people are not, not my level of crazy. So are they get elected. It's like in the army, there's no substitute for your physical presence. Being there. Okay. Okay. Well, let's, let's, uh, well, let's back up a little bit. Because, I, you know, just on what we've been talking about and, and the similitude that we have created with the uh, Adv advocates, let's look at what the militia is. Now, it's an important thing to know or remember that in the original Constitution for the United States of America, there was no Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights were things that the states that ratified the Constitution said, you know, we've got this Bill of Rights in our Constitution. These are things we really want protected. We want you to take them up in the first Congress. And there was only one state, the ninth state, the one that put the Constitution into force, that, uh, requ that requested a right to bear arms. And that was us. Really? Yes. It was a con it was a conditional ratification. Okay, we said we ratify words, this. Conditionally, either you put it in or we don't ratify it. Okay. Okay. So, right. so that that is why there is a Second Amendment to the National Constitution. Wow. Now, when that began to be impinged upon in the 1960s by the general government, and I refer I use the term general government, not federal government. That's how the founders referred to it. It is a general government, both national and federal. We took, we took reason to put in our Constitution words that echoed that in the National Constitution. All persons have the right to keep and bear arms in defense of themselves, their families, their property, and the state. Now remember before we, we saw in Article 12 that, that we owe the state to our, our physical contribution to the protection of the state as part of our protection of property. That's Article 12. And we see later on in the first part, I can probably find it faster than this. You're saying that this Article 2A, the bearing of arms in the Constitution of New Hampshire, that was written in and put in December 1st, 1982? Yes, correct. I was Secretary of Gun Owners of New Hampshire for eight years. And page 37. I, I, that's that, right. That, that, I actually the bottom, right. Okay, like thank that. you. Okay, now we saw that. We believe we had a right to keep a bare arms. We saw that we have the duty to contribute our physical bodies to the protection of the state. And then we see in Article 24, a well-regulated militia is the proper, natural, and sure defense of a state. And state should be capitalized there. Um, because it refers to our state, the state of New Hampshire. Everybody. It was a member of the militia. You hear this question on the national level. Did the Second Amendment refer only to the militia or to the people as individuals? Well, guess what? The militia was the people as individuals. There is no sequitur. You were all expected to be members of the militia. And if you look at Article 13, which states, it's Article 13, uh, no person who is conscientiously scrupulous of the lawfulness of bearing arms shall be compelled thereunto. But originally it said also that if you chose not to bear arms, you had to provide support for those who would. And you could buy yourself out. You could buy yourself out of military service with the state, but you had to contribute to the defense of the state. That's what we're calling you to do. At the most basic level, you're defending the state because you are enforcing the Constitution upon us in government. That's your duty, Article 38. The people have a right 
to require of their legislators and magistrates an exact and constant observance of the principles of the Constitution. It's your, it, what we have is a, is a populace that has been taught to believe the hierarchical form of government. We have been brainwashed into believing that the people receive their rights from government. Mm -hmm. No, government receives its rights from the people. The people's rights are inherent. Well, another way of looking at it is that the government doesn't have rights. The government exactly. has privileges and yeah. authorities. It has, a, it, it has authorities. I would even go so far as to say it has, well, it has duties. Certainly yes. it has duties. But not rights. But anything, any power that the government has is delegated from the people to the government of the state. Mm -hmm. And from the government to the state to the general government. What does... Uh, Article 7 says, sovereignty. <clears throat> and it can only be diminished by the people on the ballot while I'm Congress is in session. I love it. Seven. The people of this state have the sole <clears throat> and exclusive right of governing, them, governing themselves as a free, sovereign, and independent capital state. And do here and forever shall. I, and do and forever hereafter shall exercise and enjoy every power, jurisdiction, and right pertaining thereunto, which is not and may not hereafter be by them expressly delegated to the United States of America in Congress Assembly. Now, here's an interesting idea. This is one that just hit me. I, I this this is this is why this is the fourth edition of the People's Liberty. Because I keep these things keep keep percolating to the surface. Read Article 36. Economy being a most essential virtue in all states, capital, especially in a young one, and no pension shall be granted but in consideration of actual service. And such pensions ought to be granted only with great caution by the legislature and never for more than one year of a, at a time. And your arrogant Supreme Court justices completely converted that. So if everybody will pick this up and read <laughs> my friend. I'm serious. They did it. But, You'll say it in here. But I want you to think about this. Think about this. Chuck Douglas is low. If the people he refers to exactly this. If the people did not confer upon the state any ability to grant a pension for anything other than actual service. Please define pension in the, in the, the concept that you're speaking of. Well, a pension salary. Are we talking a, a, salary and, versus and, and, what we modern day regard as a retirement? I would say, well, I would say a no. A, a pension would be, I believe, and you know that's a good one for me to look up in the old dictionaries. But I believe a pension would be um, like we think of it. Okay. When you retire, okay. you get a pension. When right. you retire, okay. you get a pension. So then, all right. Okay. Or if the service is over. Yeah. <coughs> but in actual service, in good behavior. Do we? Is there any way in which the ability to grant a pension for anything other than actual service could have been delegated to the general government? No. No. Okay. Now, what does that say about uh, Social Security? Yeah. Okay. Well, it's getting it. Well, but even, law, even lawful citizens, right. you're getting something, a pension, after retirement, even if, I mean, we all have 401ks that we contribute to, there's, there's still pension. Is there any way that the general government could have been granted the authority to give an old age subsidy to citizens who did not actually work for the government? Absolutely uh, not. Maybe Crockett had that before. The New Hampshire Constitution is, has nothing to do with Social Security, though, right? No, that's but evil. that's a law enacted by the general government. But we did not give yeah, the general government the, gen the power to do that. We did not give that power to the to the to the cuts to the state. Could the state have further delegated delegated it to the general government? Article seven. Show me where it was explicitly delegated. It's it, it it is a logical impossibility. And the federal government I don't argue with that. <laughs> yeah, the general government is the creation of the states, yeah. not vice versa. Correct. Correct. I mean, so I had I had this argued with me when I was first running for the state. I had I had a a, 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 a potential constituent argue with me that the that the general government had created the states, and I said, "What the constitution is before? 
no, no, no. He wouldn't. He wouldn't believe that our constitution preceded that of the general government. Yes. Mm -hmm. But we are created first. Do we have a right to secede? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. What, do, what does Article 7 say? It says we are, are free, sovereign, say? and independent state. What does Article 1 say? It says we are a free, sovereign, and independent state. We did that in 1784, so we thought it then. Okay, that makes sense. In 1787, we ratified the Constitution, putting it into force. And in 1792, we amended our Constitution in large part to conform with the new Constitution for the general government. And we retained our self-description as a free, sovereign, and independent state. But wasn't secession pretty well settled with the Civil War? By yeah. whom? By force. Yeah. By force. 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 But by whom? Was it settled by those who incorporate who, who yeah. created yeah. the general government? <laughs> or was it settled by force? By settled force. by the Settled by force. Yeah. Settled by is, a de facto government. Is this, a corporate is this government, not a, a constitutional is government. Is this or is the Constitution a document of force? No, it's a consent. No. It is a consent. Regardless of that, it, it's not worth fighting that whole thing over again, is it? In 1871, Congress ratified. Okay. Is, is that worth fighting over? Are those fighting words? Unfortunately, I didn't get any co-signers. But I have a resolution in saying that the Nor a North American Union is unconstitutional. Definitely. That the mm -hmm. general Definitely. government... Did get any co sponsors for that? No. No? Nobody no. would step wow. out. The general government does not have the... We did not delegate to the general government our sovereignty or independence except that which is expressly delegated. Did we give them the authority to surrender any of our sovereignty or independence to some supranational government? Absolutely not. If somebody... Even if we, we delegated a certain portion of our sovereignty to them, and we did, if somebody can can take that which you delegated and give it to somebody else without your consent, are you free? No. Not at all. But we are a free, sovereign, and independent people. Okay, but what I'm concerned about is we don't want to fight any more wars over issues like that, right? Well, do you want to, do you? Well, then you remain a slave. Are you willing to, to, have, to be involuntarily uh, subjugated to a North American Union? Hell no, we nope. don't go. <laughs> 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 we're this. We're, we're asking yeah, fundamental we make, questions here. We make, we make decisions every day that we allow ourselves to make. Yeah, you're right. Apparently not. We have no resolution for an official article seven day. Wow, education campaign. Yeah, so let's call it. What they what they are signing on to is an argument that it is economically unattractive. Oh, so they're not saying they're against decision. it except for because it's economically, not because it's unconstitutional. Well, we have we have another similar say uh, uh, resolution saying that you know we we are against the North American Union, but it's all based on it'll cost American jobs and it'll be a loss of sovereignty, etc. What about Congressman Tancredo's view on that, though? Because he's totally against it. Well, he's but sovereignty. I'm talking about state. This is state Remember, this is the state. Up. Okay. So, okay, on the North American Union, yeah. most people will tell you that that's a conspiracy theory. It's not going to happen. There's no such thing. People that took pictures of tractors down in Texas were just, you know, doing that. It was, you know, not real. It is real, and a lot of people don't know anything about it, and they're being told it's not real. So, after this class, you should investigate that on your own too. And whether it's real or not, we can still yeah. say we expressly do not consent right. to it. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that's what the resolution says that it's unconstitutional, and we won't recognize it. We're never handed half the highway last year. They'll be outside the class. But that's, that's, yeah. Let's not get to get yeah, but, but the point is, is that we are a sovereign, a free, sovereign, independent state. And the sovereigns in the state are the people. And this is an, this is an opinion expressed continuously by the Founding Fathers. This is their worldview. It was the first nation 
on earth that the power of government came from the people rather than vice versa. Saying New Hampshire or the American States. government in general. But I mean, and, and so so too in all of the states. But on the question of secession, <coughs> having had a war over it, I mean, in order to assert that right of seceding, we're going to need something pretty big, like a. I mean, we can't just. We're going to have to have a constitutional amendment or something on that level to specifically authorize secession. Isn't it? Have us given the war that we had already. We kind of I, I'm, I'm not saying the secession is the answer, but if one wants to engage in the discussion, one has to, I mean, the war for independence didn't begin with the Declaration of Independence. The war for independence began 10 years prior to that. And one of the things, that it, it's just like in any orderly process, you have to give due notice. I, I don't, I wouldn't, I do not want to secede from the United States. Yeah, most people don't, but there but, might be some. But on the other hand, if I anticipate that they might take an action which <coughs> makes me a slave, it's my duty now to let them know that I will consider such an action to be unconstitutional. How far are you willing to be pushed? Do you have a limit? And you have to let them know beforehand. You, well, you don't just pop you don't just pop it at the end. I mean we we went prior to the declaration there was the Olive Branch petition. There were repeated attempts to negotiate and it wasn't until King George said no we are going to subjugate America and I removed them from my protection that we actually went into the mode of revolution. Okay, I can understand that point of view, but what I'm saying is I, it seems like we shouldn't assume or assert that right to secede until we get a formal now, a formal uh, constitutional law that respects that. Otherwise, but, 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 well, the law in, in, es in essence, in essence, <laughs> in essence, that is there. Is there in our constitution? Absolutely. Okay, but I mean, and, and, and the war, and you know, the South was making those same arguments. Sure. And uh, but look the, what happened? I know, and they were making those arguments, but they, in essence, if you don't notify ahead of time, then you have no right to do anything. You but, have to, you have to notify in advance. I mean, I there are things we should that. be doing. I mean, I would. Uh, I, I, I am loath that we didn't take the, the opportunity to direct our uh, senators to vote against the Law of the Seas Treaty. I realized originally, senators, U.S. senators, were at the beck and call of the legislatures. Yeah, with this legislature, well, could you get that in the room? No, you wouldn't have been able to. Um, you'd be surprised. No, you yeah, would be surprised. Again, this is where where you use political jujitsu to the extent <laughs> that the uh, administration would perceive this as a Bush uh, action. Oh yeah. Okay. okay. They would be yeah. more than right. How did, how did we get uh, the real ID through? We got it through because we're under a democratic administration. How would we get something through? that said to Senators Judd and Sununu, we are directing you to vote against the Law of the Sea Treaties, or directing you to vote against a North American Union, or the Security and Prosperity, yeah. whatever Prosperity it is, okay? Yeah. Because they perceive it as a, as a Bush policy. Jeez, I'd go crazy with that. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I mean, this is, this is, you gotta, I mean, there are there are things you do under different political landscapes. I mean, one of the things I'm introducing some of the bills I am now is on the chance or probability that they'll get rejected, and we regain a Republican legislature. And there, 
Then the, the, the bill that that, those, that Democrat le legislature defeated. And all of a sudden, it's a creature of the opposition and it will pass in a Republican legislature where it might have had tenuous support. I can see all of that. What I'm saying is I think we got to prioritize our, what time and energy we have. And some of these things are so far down the line. There's so much well, stuff I'll, there. Well, he wasn't saying we should do it or not. He's just saying in the Constitution, the class we're learning, that the right is there. And he just wanted people to agree. Uh, right. Yeah. So, so, and, 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 and again, that's all the resolution is doing is saying that this is our philosophical point of view. Right. So that five years from now, when the issue comes to the political forefront, then we have a position already on record. Dan? Yeah? Can I ask that we get kind of back on the right. classroom side, please? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> and I appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you look at Article 6. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm just, I'm, since we have limited time, I'm, and we've already done Article 8, let's do Article 9 because, again, one of the things I want to stress is the fabric, <coughs> the interweaving. And Article 9 is no hereditary office or place. No place or office whatsoever in government shall be hereditary. The abilities and integrity requisite to all not being transmissible to posterity or relations. This ties in, this, this ties in with that government cannot be used for the emolument of any family, man, family, or class of men. That it can't be hereditary. If you're looking for instruction on how to interpret an article, then you look to other <coughs> articles, not to your own personal persuasion. Let's look at Article 83. Oh, wait, 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 we don't have to turn there. Are we all familiar with Article 83? No. no. Second part? No. Okay, let's turn there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, where do we need Article 83. Article 83 is. Oh, this yes, one. one. Encouragement. 56. Oh. Encouragement. 56. Encouragement. Thank you. Knowledge and learning generally diffused through a community. Now this ties in to Article 6, right? Which has to do with education. The purpose for public education is to transmit the fundamental principles of the Constitution to the children so that when they grow up to be uh, citizens and legislators, they, well, I guess legislators are citizens almost anyway, um, <laughs> that they will know what constitutes good government. Not Part one is rights. Now you're talking about duties and obligations. Right. Learning and knowledge government. and learning generally diffused throughout, through a community being essential to the preservation of a free government. That sounds awful lot like Article 6. And spreading the opportunities and advantages of education through the various parts of the community being highly <coughs> conducive to promote this end. It shall be the duty of legislators, not the government, and magistrates, that includes all officers of the executive and judicial, in all future periods in this government to cherish the interests, not cherish the actual, but cherish the interests of literature and sciences in all seminaries and public schools to encourage private and public institutions, rewards and immunities, and we go on. Yeah. So what does the word cherish mean? Define Fine. right here. court. In court. Okay. Fine. Hold dear. Oh. Hmm? It means hold dear. It means hold dear. It also means to support. That's what it means, and I meant that in 1780. I've gone back and looked it up. But you have to look at it in context to what other articles said in 1783. And if we go back to Article 6 and we look at what it said in 1784, we find, and unfortunately, you can't do this. Only I can do this. You can if you. Get the CD, pick up when you pick up the CD. I've got the original form of Article 86 with the additions and the deletions and additions that were put in place in uh, 1968. And most importantly, what we see is that we gave we had the we gave the legislature the authority to create schools uh, in the several towns, parishes, bodies, or religious bodies corporate or religious societies within the state to make adequate provision at their own expense. At their own oh. expense. Okay. 
So the duties of the, now the bodies of the <coughs> towns, what we consider our political subdivisions, or now school districts, are bodies corporate. They are public incorporations. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you look at, uh, at all of at those words and what they meant in 1780. Stricken from the list of uh, obligated entities are towns, but towns are not what we consider, uh, are not what we consider uh, towns now. Towns was any cluster of buildings, preferably with a wall around it. It would be most loosely considered to be what we call <coughs> the unincorporated places now. But the important thing is that the obligation to adequately provide for education was with the towns when the word cherish was put into the Constitution. Now, that, that obligation that to, to adequately furnish, uh, provide for education was stricken, and there is controversy as to whether it was lawfully stricken, but it was stricken in 1968. When that was stricken, that still didn't change the meaning of the word cherish. To change the meaning of the word cherish, you would have had to have put something else in. So cherish still means the same thing it did in 1784. Let me comment on that. The Scopes trial, the monkey trial, you all remember that. Yeah. Please read that because the Supreme Court defined the word cherish in that uh, Supreme Court case. Thank you very much. Accordingly, Article 4 of the United States Constitution, Section 1 of the United States Constitution, tells you that the judicial proceedings that took place in the Scopes trial are available to us as, quote, judicial proceedings. Read Article 4, Section 1. So all of the, in other words, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. The word cherish was defined. It wasn't defined like the arrogant idiots over here on the cliff have defined it to create multiple millions of dollars for the bureaucrats <coughs> on the Claremont case. That's totally unconstitutional. Uh, here's another beauty on the Scopes trial. Who here thinks that the Scopes trial determined that uh, it was, that, that uh, Darwinism uh, had to be taught in public schools. That's what they taught me in government school. Yeah, what, did, what, what, was the, what was the actual outcome of the Scopes trial? The actual outcome, he, he the, 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 the actual the, the, outcome yeah. was the fellow was convicted of yeah. teaching Darwinism in, in the schools. By the, by the jury. By the jury. He was found to have violated the law. That's the outcome of the Scopes trial. It's absolutely opposite of what you've been taught. The movie is a fiction. The facts of the case are that it was illegal or unlawful to teach Darwinism in the public schools. He was convicted. And, okay. It wasn't very important. Yeah. It wasn't important. <laughs> well, and, 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 and what, and, and what, and, uh, what of this gentleman who did it? He was put up to it. He was a, he was somebody who was convinced to teach it specifically so that he could be convicted, so that he could be accused of it. It was an ACLU case, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. It ACLU was. said Yes. Oh. You just you know, food for thought about the problem that you're. I, I got one question. All of the things that you're telling us, Dan, is good and rational and true. <laughs> But we live in a policy, we live in a state now where all of the things that you say are ignored and denigrated by the Supreme Court of the state, by the State House of Representatives, by the State Senate, by the governor, by all branches okay, so of the what do you? Okay, so what is it? Beyond going up and testifying, I apologize for my bleeding. Um, I'm sorry, right, you're bleeding for liberty. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Beyond going up and testifying, what do we need to do? We need to get legislators into that body who believe the same way as the people. We need to teach the people about the right, their rights and their sovereignty. That's, I mean, part of what, I mean, that's why I, I tell you, you know, this CD and is there for you to take. I appreciate anything you give me in return, but it's free for you to copy, but to give it? to your friends. This yeah. PDF. Uh, I, I have an answer for this job. This is PDF file. Okay. But it, it, it is to be copied, distributed, taught. 
Remember, a frequent recurrence to the fundamental principles of the Constitution. We are called to be <coughs> talking about these things, not uh, just when we meet here together. Constantly. Constantly. I mean, I'm able to engage people in, in discussions about the Constitution when I'm in the grocery store. You got to get people excited about it. You got to get people excited about taking control of their government because they ought. It's their duty. This is this is not a, a passive government. This is not a passive society where you just go along and go on for the ride. This is an active government where you are compelled to take part and to to require the performance of your legislators and magistrates. Yes. Getting back to the, the, the boring question of the definition of cherish, um, did we, I didn't quite understand where we ended up. Did we end up where cherish meant merely to respect the goings on or cherish in the sense that it has an obligation to actually support? Well, that is where the Supreme Court ended up. But, but that was is, federal, right? No, no state. That was state. state. That was state. 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 But okay. is there any, but under the, the constitutional definition of cherish, again, it's one fabric of unity and amity. Everything agrees with everything else. Under the constitutional definition of charity, under the constitutional description of who is obligated, it's not the legislature that is obligated to cherish education. It is the legislators. A legislator cannot enact a law. Only a legislature can. And that was not an accident. Okay, just as we start off in the beginning, when they forgot to put sovereign into, I think, Article 1, Part 2, they did a little carrot and wrote it in. If they had meant to write legislature instead of legislator, like they did in Massachusetts, they would have crossed it out and put in URE. Aside from central funding, what role did legislators have in the early republic to cherish education? How could they actually cherish education without voting? Okay. Well, what did they what did they vote? They did vote on education. They voted uh, the first public education funding law in New Hampshire required, and I don't know, I can't recall the specific amount, but they required that each town raise so many pounds for each shilling that they raised in support of the state. But it was the towns that had to raise it. They and. That was that was the law in response to that article. Bizarrely enough, that's almost effectively an unfunded mandate. They mandated it as a means of cherishing it, but they did not raise the funds for it. Which I mean, that's maybe well, okay. Well, okay. I mean, but, that's maybe but, fine, but, but that's right. And I'm not arguing. I'm not saying it's a bad. Right. Thing remember, that, remember, that's, that's, that's okay. pre-Article 28A. Right. Okay. So and, and they just said you're going to have complete local control. You're going to pay for it. You're going to elect your own teachers. You're going to provide what buildings you choose to provide. It's, it's all on your doorstep. Mm -hmm. We're just going to make sure that okay, you, you do, do it. it. Yeah, mm -hmm. we're going because to it's necessary and prudent. Part one, Article six, and part one and part two, Article eighty three. So they yeah. did have the compulsory authority to do that, though, to make sure that you do it. Implies that the towns have to do it. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Uh, it says part, part one, Article six, said that the legislature is hereby authorized to, from time to time to authorize schools, which would mean both to create them and to make sure that they were functioning properly. Did that come with any measure of state regulation? Or did that come much later? That came much later. I have a question here. It says, and all seminaries and public schools. So then uh, Catholic schools no. and private schools should... Seminary is any post-secondary education. Okay, so that had a different meaning back then. Yes. Okay. Jim raised a very excellent question, and it was regard to the arrogance, particularly of the, uh, sure. the courts, sure. and your inability to get any justice. Uh, Dan has been very erudite in conveying to you the three branches of government, executive, legislation, and the judiciary. But I want to address the fourth branch of government. Media. And the fourth branch of government <laughs> is you, First. and each and every one of you. <laughs> Now, how do I say that? The power that you have 
is in being a juror. I've been privileged to be associated with the fully informed jury association yes. for many years, almost from its inception. I sponsored and got passed through the House, and Stan will tell you, when I was a rep, on over several occasions, the passage in the House, but unfortunately in our Senate we have a bundle of, guess what, a turners. Now you notice I used the word a turner, T-T-T-O-R-N-E-R-S, and as Dan says here, every word has a specific meaning. I want you, this is a little challenge so you'll understand for yourself. Look up the word attorner, A-T-T-O-R-N-E, because that's the root of the word attorney, which your brother is. <laughs> uh -huh. However, you'll find it, you can have some fun with him. <laughs> Anyhow, as a juror, you have, just one out of 12, you have the opportunity to nullify everything that the legislature unfortunately passes by virtue of, even if the evidence shows that the corporate state, which we're dealing with now, and I won't get into that, unless somebody wants me to at some time. We are in an interest, but our corporate government is you usurped our constitutional government, and you have a problem, big problem there. And it all comes down to money, no, I don't want to go into that one. But I have a four minute uh, drama, which Dan has seen, involving gold and silver and the so-called uh, commercial paper, we're compelled to use. But we are in deep doo-doo right now, and so are the banks, but that's another story. Back to the fully informed jury. I want you all to go to www.fija, feature, fully informed jury association.org. Read the information that we have there, because each and every one of you, if you ever get called for jury, how many of you called for jury duty? Anybody? Well, let me ask you, did you get, did you get a questionnaire from the prosecutor? Mm -hmm. sure. Now what did you put on the pre questionnaire? Well, answers to questions. You put it all, right? questions. And what you did, you unwittingly let them stack the jury. Mm -hmm. The only thing that you're required to put on that form, and my son was called on this, I'll tell you what happened, is your name, address, and how to get all your telephone and how to get all. They are not entitled to any information from you or any one of you. My son got one. He says, Dad, he says, uh, do I have to fill this up? He says, hey, no. There's no compelled performance for you to tell them what. You are to be a jury of your peers. So he sent it back in, and he did get called. And he goes down there, and a prosecutor called him, Ross Barlow. He says, Your Honor, I want him held in contempt of court. He did not fill out this form. He says, Come to the bench. So my son goes up to the bench with the judge and uh, <laughs> the prosecutor, and he says, uh, can you show me the law that requires him to fill that out? This was a good, this was one who had a little sense. Uh, well, I'm not prepared to do so, you're right. That's it. My son did call for jury duty. He was on the jury, and guess what? He did what he was supposed to do, nullify it. So you have that power, but you use it as a juror. You don't tell them anything. Don't you just dare disclose to your adversary, because your adversary today is corporate government not the constitutional government. Yeah, Thank you very much. You're very welcome, Dick. And what does, what does the Constitution say about jurors? In order to reap the fullest advantage of the inestimable, this is Article 21, inestimable privilege of the trial by jury, great care ought to be taken that none but qualified jurors should be appointed to serve, and such ought to be fully compensated for their travel, time, and attendance. They only wanted and what would be a proper qualification for somebody to be a juror? Not the sense. law. U.S. citizen. Something about the law, first of all. Law or? Lack thereof. Constitution. Constitution. Yeah. Wouldn't that be the highest thing that they ought to well, know? Sure. Yeah. They don't need any law that's going to be an issue of controversy. They're going to have laid out in front of them. They need to know the Constitution so that they know whether the law that's laid out in front of them is constitutional. And juries not only have the jurors not only have the right to take issue with the law as presented, but whether a particular law is applicable in a particular case. Mm -hmm. And the punishment for that case, if it is something that you feel is uh, it, well, it's right in our constitution and your bill of what eighteen as far as uh, yeah. uh, if you agree to, if if you think it's unjust because of uh, uh, and it's excessive, mm -hmm. even even though they have proven. If you
you think the penalty is excessive, find them not guilty. All penalties, penalties ought to be, this is a beautiful one. Yes, it is. All penalties ought to be proportional to the nature of the offense. No wise legisl legislature will affix the same punishment to crimes of theft, forgery, and the like to those which they do of murder and treason. For the same indistinguishable severity is exerted against all offenses, the people are led to forget the real distinction in the crimes themselves and to commit the most flagrant with as little compunction as they do the lightest offense. For the same reason, a multitude of sanguinary laws. Anybody know what sanguinary is? That which draws blood. blood. Yeah. 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 Bloody laws. <laughs> is both impolitic and unjust, the, the true design of all punishment being to reform and not to exterminate mankind. Wow. Punishment to fit the crime. But mm -hmm. Article 15 is where you have your right to trial by jury. And it's but rather interesting. But Article 15 is, 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 it says crime or offense. There's the word offense. Wait, that last line then, isn't that saying that uh, <coughs> I think cannot it's have capital punishment? No, because they discuss know. capital it punishment. To, it has to be so it's a true the design crime. of all punishments being but to reform and not, not to exterminate. exterminate. Right. On, on its own, I would argue. On, it, on its own. People. But I'm again, it is a that. fabric. And in the fabric, we see the authorization for capital crimes. Where? Okay, where is that? Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution yeah. as well. But in, this life one. but in this one, this is ours, yeah. uniquely. It is, it, let's see, that's Article 18. It's got to be Article 14 or 15. Um, Article 15. That's your right to trial by jury. No. Well, yes, it is. But in addition to every person held to answer in any crime or, or punishment. 16 uh, capital cases. Is it 16 there? Jury, trial, yeah. capital Right. Case. You are in a capital case. You, there is no equivocation for the trial by jury. You'll notice in Article 14 it says trial by jury or law of the land. So there is the open door for a crime to be punished without a trial by jury. Except in civil cases. That's interesting. But more importantly, that when you come in, in regard to the question at hand, is that in capital crimes, there is nothing but a trial by jury. That means that there had to be an admission for capital crimes. And the extermination said extermination of mankind, which is different from extermination of a man. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, I support well, I mean, that penalty, but when I read the book, right, like no, yeah, right, right, right. but what I they mean, were really doing was saying you don't have laws that are so egregious that at the end of the day, nobody's left. <laughs> and it's 410. So, what's the will of people? <laughs> oh, I have a question. Well, well, let's let's talk about, about this a little bit. Your question is: How do we proceed with this? How do we proceed with this? Well, Dennis, you shall proceed with this. Dennis, you want to talk about that? So I would proceed with the coming up on the next answer. Dennis actually wanted to create the training for you. You presume we thought ahead very far. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's all emails or what? Yeah, the, the, next, um, the next thing on the agenda really is to ramp up the bill review stuff. Because we, we have to have, uh, we basically have to be a well-ordered militia, well-trained militia by January. Because that's when the bills are going to come down. Um, so that will come down fast and furious. Yeah, the, the enemy will definitely be at the gates. Um, so, so the next, and it's all basically by email. Okay. We, we will send out in our next uh, monthly newsletter. You can pretty much expect agenda item number one to be bill review session starting up. Well, let, let's let's. I mean, this has been hardly, in, in my estimation, more than a, a, prim, a primer, but. <clears throat> Less things an advocate should know. Is there at least a feeling of reasonable familiarity with the New Hampshire Constitution? No, I'm gonna have to, I was going to ask you, is there a course I can take or something? Being from New York and... <laughs> yeah, okay, great. <laughs> All right. <laughs>
Why did you ask? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I mean, it, 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 it's just a natural outgrowth okay. of, what the, of what has been happening since the last few years. Yeah, do you think the article search for the federal constitution would be something which would show, say, Between to modify our constitution to the extent well, Article of, 6? Yeah. The article 6 is a new supremacy clause. No, no, it does not. It modifies our laws. It does not modify our constitution. That's correct. That's what I'm saying. As far as public policy versus statute, because public policy and statute uh, have been and let's keep on point. What's the next step in New Hampshire Liberty Army kids training? But let's let's just let's just go through. There's at least a, a feeling of passing familiarity, sufficient familiarity with the New Hampshire Constitution or the ability to get it. How do we feel about familiarity with the United States Constitution? Everybody feels confident at that. Yeah. And actually, it should not impinge upon the job that much, right. because we will be concerned with state law, uh, and only to the extent that a state law conflicts with uh, general law should there be an issue. Uh, does everybody know how a bill becomes law? Dennis. Dennis is no. <laughs> I, I, I'm sure most people don't. Well, there's an outline. There's a uh, a picture. Yeah, there's a thing here. Programming. There you go. Read the picture. There's a Dilbert button. Okay, I, I want everybody. Can, seems rather almost too now, but how many people feel they know how a uh, bill becomes law in this state? Let's see what the Constitution is. Okay, so forty percent. We had a training session at the State House last Thursday. Do we have a plan for another one? Not until the legislature comes back in session and there's activity to, to Is engage. it necessary for such activity to be for, or would it be sufficient to discuss it now? I, I think we're sort of towards the end of our time. I think what would be good. I know we're towards the end of our time. What, what we've done in years past is included how a bill becomes a law as part of the bill review or bill triage training session. Typically. Is that, can, is that when are your sessions, though, Dennis? Are they during the day? Well, typically weekends. for those, we do them when people are available, i.e. evenings and weekends. Oh, okay, that's great. That's great. Um, <clears throat> no, the basic state house decorum. How do people do? How do people feel about knowing the state house decorum? Yeah, I've been okay. in there, so I know. Okay. Yeah, been in there. Okay, this is one that can be covered pretty readily. One, the chair of the committee governs the committee. That's pretty straightforward. You should you should endeavor to dress nicely uh, for a couple reasons. One is a show of respect. I mean, we have to appear in suits and ties by rules of the house. Uh, it's also a matter a matter of getting taken seriously. If you come in in jeans with holes and a t-shirt, you're at least on the face of it going to be summarily dismissed. Now, that said. On my committee, we had a bill on raising the age for marriage consent. And a gentleman came in who looked like the proverbial hasty. And when he spoke, he spoke with the greatest eloquence. And he was just amazing. <laughs> and, you know, it's just like, wow, what a sleeper. And he got everybody's attention. But, generally speaking, first impressions matter. Um, the, in, in order to speak, you have to submit a request to speak by card in the House or checkbox in the Senate. Um, you need to be direct. It is unwise to read written testimony. Not that you shouldn't necessarily have test written testimony, but you submit it and you speak extemporaneously. It's much more effective. Um, when you are, you cannot question the committee, the committee can question you. If, if you wanted to pose a question, you, I would introduce it by saying, this is purely rhetorical, but. Uh, but even I, as a legislator testifying, cannot question the committee. They question you. Word of advice, listen to people, learn to know who your friends and who your enemies are on the committee. Uh, because there have been, t being on the questioning side is a very powerful place to be. 
because you can uncover your enemies and you can draw out your friends. And I've had situations where I had a friend, and I'm not saying an individual with whom I was a friend, but a friendly testator who was not articulating what they needed to articulate. And I kept trying to draw them to the place, and it got to the point that they perceived me adversarially. Okay? <laughs> and I'm just trying to get them to say what they need to say to prove their point. So, also, be slow to answer. Don't say the first thing that comes to the top of your head. Especially if you, you can sense that the person questioning you is adversarial. There is nothing wrong with taking a few moments to compose your thoughts so that you say exactly what you mean and not what they want to hear. Or have them qualify the questions so you understand. Before yeah, absolutely. Before yeah. I answer that question, can you please define the term? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, be slow to answer, as slow as you need to be. Always good at those. Um, but above all, uh, representatives are addressed as representative with their last name. Uh, chairman, vice chairman are addressed by those titles. Madam Chair, uh, Chairman. Um, they, senators are addressed as senator. You do not get on a familiar basis, even if you are on a familiar basis with some of them. When they are behind that desk, they are a senator and you address them as <coughs> piece of institutional knowledge that we really ought to document, one of a slew of things we ought to document. Rule number one in HLA testimony is three minutes. Yes. If it takes you three minutes and five seconds, you're better just sitting down and shutting up. I, I would not go with it that hard and fast, <laughs> but generally speaking, if you can do it in three minutes, good. Five minutes is okay, but it's getting a little long. You do not want to be taking 10 and 15 minutes. Uh, I mean, you just, people start, you know. I have an answer to that. Hey, uh, let me inject this. When you have something, you get you to do part of it, you to do another part of it, and you to do another part of it. So that it's not the same person that's eaten up at the time. You've already programmed this, but you get everything you want to say, but you haven't done over a period. Three minutes is, Dennis is absolutely right. I've seen them, their eyes glaze over, they don't know what's going on. So you do it that way, that interruption, and partial, put it in partial. And then they get the message. Or, or if it's or if it's something that you really want to project, give your base testimony in a way that it baits the question. So the so the to the to the best of, and and have your answers lined up before you. Okay, this is what I do when I'm going into a committee, and a lot of the stuff I'm I'm doing is arcane, and I have I've, I've reserved certain parts of what I'm going to say for questions. So that when they ask the question, I'm glad you asked that, you know? You have you have the answer ready you, and you testify in a manner that baits the question. No, there's nothing wrong with that. When they're asking you questions, you can go on. And you can go on in the ad infinitum because they're going to be questioning you. Right. Yeah. Okay. You might you might the, the part that you are enforcing upon them ought to be on the order of 3 minutes. Five minutes at the outside. But it doesn't mean you won't be there for 15 because you have drawn them into your territory. Get them to fight on your battlefield. Uh, let's see, next thing. Understand the committee process. I, um, that's pretty basic and it's actually part of how a bill becomes law. So we'll cover, do that at a different time. Dan, yeah. one little question about the actual going in there and testifying. Um, I noticed that uh, they always have a seat. Should you sit down and do it or can you stand up? I would sit. Okay. I've only seen one person stand and... I was criticized for standing. Yeah. It, and I remember, I, what I remember many times. Henry Being McElroy. a teacher, I'm more comfortable I, standing up no. when I have something to say. But you know. it puts you. I'm like you. But, but, 
again, you're showing respect. Okay. Play by their rules. Their rules are you have a chair to sit in. Otherwise, you would come across as lecturing them, and that will be a turnoff. Right. That's exactly what I was told. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I take my rules to the school of hot knocks. <laughs> the governor sits in for chair. Of course, it's important. Right. But they're, they're Good right. point. <laughs> Personally, I shake too much to stand in. Um, we have the bill review system, which you can better address another time. Liberty index report cards should be addressed another time. Uh, I think we need to set up another, um, yeah. another yeah, session another day. We can continue with this because I know, yeah. personally, I've got to take off. Everything, everything else is, is, is better for another time as well. Yeah. We'll um, figure out another the date and time for uh, round two and right. we'll let everybody know. And, um, is, is Saturday afternoons like a good time for people? Yes, yeah. typically. Yeah. 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 Right. Yes. <laughs> rhetorical question. I wanted to get there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank well, thank everybody for coming and yes. uh, seeing everybody. Great. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Dan.